Hi. On the 25th of April, we in New Zealand and Australia commemorate Anzac Day, an event similar to Veterans and Memorial Day in the US, or Remembrance, Hoppy Day in the UK. Anzac stands for Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, and it's on the 25th of April because that was the date of the Gallipoli landings in World War I. The Dardanelles Campaign The Dardanelles are an extremely historic part of the world, the location of the Hellespont, the strategically important waterway connecting the Mediterranean to the Sea of Marmara, and then the Black Sea, dividing and connecting Asia Minor and Europe. The ancient city of Troy was located here, and the Persian Emperor Xerxes constructed a double pontoon bridge of boats across this waterway, according to Herodotus, so he could march his enormous army across in their march towards Greece in 480 BC. In 411, the Hellespont was the site of a naval battle between the Athenians and Spartans at Sinusema, a narrow Athenian victory. Six years later, at Egospotami, also in the Hellespont, 350 Athenian and Spartan warships would do battle again, this time resulting in the Athenian fleet being almost completely annihilated. And early the next year, Athens surrendered, ending the 27-year-old Peloponnesian War. This video is not about the Gallipoli campaign itself. It's about the archaeological investigations of the Gallipoli battlefield. But for those not familiar with the Gallipoli campaign, I'll summarise it for you first. In 1914, with the war on the Western Front paralysed by the horrors of trench warfare, Britain was looking for another way to make progress against the Central Powers. Winston Churchill, at the time First Lord of the Admiralty, proposed a naval attack on the Dardanelles which, if passed, the Allied battleships could bombard Constantinople, not Istanbul, not yet, and potentially force the Ottomans out of the war. An appeal for help from Russia against the Ottomans caused planning for the attack to begin. The Ottoman Turks knew the importance of the Dardanelles and had fortified them appropriately. Coastal defence batteries, minefields and torpedo nets were established on the strait. Naval attacks were launched by the Allies, the main one being on the 18th of March 1915. The outer batteries were bombarded by the battleships, and after the Turks abandoned them, Royal Marines were landed to ensure the destruction. Trawlers were used as minesweepers to try to clear the minefields, while the Turkish gun batteries exchanged fire with the battleships. Casualties mounted. The naval force made minimal progress and fell back. The Allied fleet had three battleships lost, three heavily damaged, a cruiser heavily damaged, and a battle cruiser heavily damaged. The decision was made to land a force of infantry to seize the Turkish forts and allow the minesweepers to work at clearing the minefields without being constantly bombarded. This took time to arrange, giving the Turks plenty of time to prepare their defences. The main landing would be at Cape Hellas by the British 29th Division. Five landing beaches named S, V, W, X and Y, with artillery support from the battleships on three sides of the peninsula. A separate surprise landing to the north, with no artillery support, was conducted by the Anzacs. And two diversionary attacks were made, by the Royal Naval Division and by the French. The landings were a disorganised nightmare for the Allied force. Around 6,500 men were killed or wounded at Hellas, and another 2,900 at Anzac Cove. Instead of being able to sweep across the peninsula towards the forts as planned, the two sides were rapidly embroiled in bloody trench warfare, which dragged on for eight and a half months before the Allies retreated, and the Gallipoli campaign was abandoned. The casualty numbers vary depending on your source. Stowers, in his 2005 book, listed that the Allies lost 141,547 soldiers killed or wounded. 7,991 of those were New Zealanders. 28,150 were Australians, 27,000 French, 4,779 Indian, and 142 Canadians. The Turks lost 251,309 soldiers killed or wounded. The Turkish victory propelled forward the career of one Colonel Mustafa Kemal, Ataturk. Yes, that Ataturk. So where does archaeology come into this? 
Believe it or not, there were some archaeological investigations going on at Gallipoli during the campaign. An Australian soldier, Sergeant Cyril Lawrence, noted Roman pottery while digging the B3 tunnel at the Pimple near Lone Pine. He wrote, In places we run through great deposits of pottery, buried as low as 20 feet. This is very fine stuff, and it's in excellent state of preservation. Rather red and of a very fine texture. Seems to be all the one class of work. When the Wargraves Commission investigated the site in 1924, excavating an area for the site of the current obelisk memorial, they found a Roman camp, burials, and coins there. The modern archaeological team also found some ceramic shards in the recent study. Further south at Hellas, a Welsh Royal Engineers Sergeant Major, R.S. Jones, uncovered an ancient Greek inscription. He transcribed it and sent a copy back to Wales where his family got it translated by classicist Gilbert Norwood. Norwood wrote back to Jones to get more information about the discovery. Unfortunately, Jones had been killed by a shell. The inscription was a dedication by the city of Elias to King Attalus, son of King Attalus, called Philadelphus, the saviour and benefactor of the city. Attalus was unable to protect the entire peninsula from a Thracian invasion, but saved the city of Elias the ruins of which were then being covered in Allied trenches. Trenches dug at the Battle of Suvla, beginning in August 1915, north of Anzac Cove, uncovered evidence for the ancient Greek city of Alo Peconessus. Two Greek inscriptions dating to the 1st century AD were found by British captain George Augustus Orden. These were chance finds in the process of digging military earthworks. The French army at Hellas took their archaeology a lot more seriously, though. In the tradition of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt, they ran a full-blown archaeological excavation during the campaign. The archaeological project was seen as an important propaganda effort, the idea being it would signal to the world that French cultural values could prevail even in the midst of death and suffering. The French troops encountered stone sarcophagi while entrenching on the plateau of Esky Hislerik, just above Morto Bay and Esbeach. The archaeological team of four excavated 38 sarcophagi and 18 funerary jars and amphoras at the site, the cemetery of the city of Elias. The grave goods noted were vases from the 6th century BC and 3rd century BC, um, jewellery made from bronze, glass paste and shell. Much of the material is now held at the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul and the Louvre in Paris. During the campaign, there were three battles of Crithia, fierce fighting on the Hellas front. But nevertheless, the French excavation continued right until the 12th of December 1915, when the French troops withdrew from the peninsula. Now to look at the archaeological project that took place in Gallipoli from 2010 to 2014. It was called the Joint Historical and Archaeological Survey, or JHAS. The archaeological team was primarily Australian and Turkish, and had a New Zealand historian with them. The focus of the project was the entrenchments around Anzac Cove, as defined by the Treaty of Lausanne, and did not look at the wider battlefield where the British and French were fighting. The archaeological team gathered a huge number of historic maps, aerial photographs, and documents created by both sides, and combined this information with a pedestrian survey of the surface features to build up a comprehensive digital map of the battlefield using GIS software. Intrusive techniques such as test pitting and taking soil cores were not used. Ground penetrating radar was used, however, to find infilled trenches and underground tunnels not visible on the surface. Magnetometry would be less useful in this context given the sheer quantity of metal present in the soil that would ruin a magnetometer survey. The archaeologists surveyed 688 different military earthworks, 491 Anzac and 197 Turkish, and found numerous artifacts littering the surface of the ground. 785 in the Anzac areas and 456 in the Turkish. The survey allowed the team to plot the change of the battlefield over time, and they divided the battle into three phases. Phase 1 lasted for just a few days, starting with the landing. The Anzacs were driven back from Gun Ridge and Baby 700 by fierce Turkish resistance. The troops, believing they would be evacuated, given the failure to push and land, drifted back to the beach, but that evacuation never came. General Sir Ian Hamilton instead ordered them to dig in. Now you only have to dig. Dig, dig, until you are safe. 
and so the troops hurriedly dug themselves in, wherever they happened to be, creating crude defensive positions such as slip trenches. While there were engineers present, design was not a priority early on, as basic survival was the sole concern. As a result, the Phase 1 earthworks were sometimes badly sighted and poorly designed. Phase 2, which lasted for a month, saw the troops improving and consolidating their positions. The engineers now designed a proper trench system. Gun positions needed to be established, water sources found, overhead cover created by covering the trenches with corrugated iron and soil, and piers need to be constructed for resupply. Phase 3 saw the earthworks becoming quite formidable and downright labyrinthian. The focus was moving underground, creating subterranean tunnels and bunkers. The nature of the soil there meant that the tunnels could be excavated without buttressing, carved straight out of the subsoil. Tunnels would be dug out towards the enemy, and the miners would listen for the sound of enemy picks. If detected, an explosive charge would be detonated to collapse the enemy tunnel. Major Zeki Bey of the Turkish army was shocked by the Anzac excavations opposing his position. I used to watch heaps and heaps of earth, always accumulating and extending, everywhere heaps and more heaps. I used to say to myself, what are they about? These Australians will tunnel to Constantinople. The JHAS team mapped one of the more interesting features at Quinn's Post, known as the Malone Terraces. Lieutenant Colonel William Malone commanded the Wellington Infantry Battalion, famous for taking and holding Chunuk Bear, where they were shelled by both sides while enduring Ottoman assaults, and when finally relieved, they only had 70 of their 760 men still standing. Malone ordered the creation of these large terraces behind the front line at Quinn's Post, sheltered spots where the troops could get some respite and socialise, rather than huddling alone in individual trenches. Lone Pine is the most important location for Australians. An Ottoman position stormed and held by the Australian troops in part of the same August offensive as the Battle of Chanak Bear. A large cemetery was constructed by the War Graves Commission in 1923, and it now occupies a key part of the site. The GPR survey, done by JHAS, revealed the Australian tunnels or trenches that run under the cemetery. The artefacts found during the survey paint a picture of life in the trenches. Bullets, stripper clips, barbed wire, and shrapnel were found, as you'd expect. The time fuses from the tips of shells are made from thick brass and preserve well. Old tin cans from food rations were found, and millions of these would have been used and discarded. Some of them were reused at the time to make jam tin bombs, filled with pieces of Turkish shrapnel and other scrap, with an explosive charge to make an improvised hand grenade. A fragment of glass from a trench periscope was found at Quinn's Post. These are important tools for observing the enemy from the safety of the trench. An Australian soldier, Lance Corporal William Beach, invented the periscope rifle, allowing the rifle to be used from the safety of the trench with a remote trigger. And Anzac troops used them to great effect. Personal effects like buttons, buckles, fragments of military boots were recovered, as well as one of the classic blue British water canteens of the time. At the Turkish front line trench, at Dead Man's Ridge, a pattern 1903 Turkish Mauser bayonet was found in two pieces, the broken blade trapped in the trunk of a tree. The use of landscape archaeology on the Anzac battlefield, combined with extensive historic research, has allowed the JHAS team to look past the modern landscape, eroded, overgrown, and peppered with memorials, to see the place as it was in 1915. If this topic interests you, I recommend picking up this book, Anzac Battlefield, A Gallipoli Landscape of War and Memory, that presents the findings of the JHAS project and has formed the core of my information for this video. Thanks for watching, and please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Cheers!